The history of outlaw gangs and their villainous exploits has been the subject of countless projects covering the madness of the Old West. Whether it's academia, entertainment, or your own personal research, the lives of criminals saturates our understanding and memories of the Western frontier. Even if your knowledge of the Wild West isn't as complete, odds are you've heard of Jesse James and the James Younger Gang, or Sam Young and the Black Hills Bandits. You've also probably seen or heard of their most infamous accomplishments, ranging from bank stickups to train robberies. Most famously, you've probably heard of the Union Pacific Big Springs robbery, put on by the latter, and the largest train heist in the history of the Union Pacific Railroad. Then there was the James Younger Gang, known for committing the first major train robbery west of the Mississippi. They hit the Rock Island Railroad, and never looked back in regards to targeting locomotives. But what if we told you both of these legendary banditos were inspired by a lesser known brotherhood of outlaws, who staked their claim to fame in the Midwest, committing the first ever peacetime train robbery in United States history. As an effort to shed some light on one of the most fascinating collections of criminals and crime families alike, here is a deeper dive into the mythos of the Reno gang, their history defining locomotive theft, and the violent legacy they left behind in the bloody aftermath. The extended lore of the Reno gang begins in 1813, when the family matriarch, James Reno, transplanted his family from the Salt River area of Kentucky to Jackson County, Indiana. The family found a parcel of farmland that would eventually be settled as Old Rockford, just north of present-day Seymour, Indiana. James Reno and his family were the first settlers on the land, and would become fixtures to Old and New Rockford for generations. The next generation, though, had already been born prior to the move. Wilkinson Reno, the son of James and Anne, was born on March 4th, 1802, and accompanied the family to Jackson County. Wilkinson lived the average life as a boy, teenager, and eventually young man in rural Hoosier country. By 1835, Wilkinson met and married Julia Ann Freyhafer. They wed and moved in together on the same family farm Wilkinson had been raised on, now a 1,200-acre ranch of a growing community. It didn't take long for the Reno family to grow and further generations to arrive. In 1837, it was Frank Reno's birth, with John Reno coming a year later in 1838. They were followed by Simeon, later known as Sim, in 1843, Clinton, or Honest Clint, in 1847, William in 1848, and at long last, a baby girl named Laura in 1851. Honest Clint and Laura Reno were too young, and in Laura's case, not even born yet, when the elder Reno brothers started finding their way into mischief. It came at such an early age, and the family circumstances didn't help much. The Reno children were raised under a very strict roof, with both of their parents, Wilkinson and Julia Ann, enforcing Methodist teachings and a long laundry list of rules. Every Sunday, the kids were forced to stay inside and read Bible verses from dusk until dawn. They had to attend Bible school, and the way they presented themselves in public had to conform to the stern, conservative farming lifestyle that was popular within family units back in the day. The real criminal shenanigans began with Frank and John as young, bored boys without much better to do on lazy summer afternoons. John would later write about the times he and his older brother would camp outside of the family farm, right where the dooryard intersected with the main road. Whenever an unsuspecting traveler would walk or ride by, they'd offer up a short rest and a bit of entertainment. Of course, this was no ordinary entertainment, but rather tricks in the form of crooked games of cards. Every card game would somehow involve money or gambling, only for the Reno boys to plan ahead and guarantee their winnings. Even if the wayward travelers knew they were being defrauded, it was never enough of an issue to prevent the boys from doing it again. In 1849, the 11-year-old John Reno apparently had enough of the Bible lessons and card game stings and ran away from home, despite still being at quite the young age. He made it all the way to Louisville, Kentucky, 
completing a 55-mile trek by way of a stolen horse in Old Rockford. From Louisville, John hitched a ride to New Orleans. What he did exactly in the Big Easy isn't well defined, but the second oldest Reno sibling did return to Jackson County, Indiana in 1850. It was then he devised a plan to embezzle money from his parents, travel more of the Midwest, only to return home once again by 1851. 1851 became a critical year for the Reno brothers and the entire Reno family at large. Laura Reno was born on January 16th to kick off the year, but everything only went downhill from there. Plaguing the town of Old Rockford was a series of mysteriously set fires that burned down much of the town's businesses and infrastructure. Sometimes, it was the homes of Rockford's own citizens that caught fire too. At first, there was no rhyme or reason to explain the fires. They occurred both in the middle of the night and under daylight. There was no hostile Native American presence in the area. Neither were there any known arsonists or career criminals. No lightning storms or brush fires. All anyone in Old Rockford knew was if the fires continued, the town would ultimately be destroyed. In an effort to preserve their newfound community, the town was rebuilt multiple times and eventually renamed New Rockford. One Rockford citizen, Meade W. Shields, was so taken aback by the mysterious arsons, they took an idea all the way to the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad, whom he convinced to build a junction right across his property to interact with the JM&I Railroad. Shields' property and the newly built junction would eventually morph all the way into Seymour, Indiana, made an official town by 1852. This was in stark contrast with Rockford, which struggled to regain its footing after the first couple of years of fires. After seven years, the arsons finally stopped, and no official suspect or person of interest was ever recorded. That is, unless you count the unfounded rumors that the Reno brothers were responsible. When you take a step back and look at the situation, it makes sense. There was a motive. The Reno brothers were known for scheming ways to purchase new land for cheap, to add to their holdings and overall wealth. There was also the long history of eldest Reno brothers getting into hijinks, ripping off travelers, and committing various crimes. John was still under heavy scrutiny by Rockford locals for his 1849 horse theft, and it only made sense he was up to no good once more. By the end of the 1850s, Wilkinson Reno felt the pressure mounting against him and his sons, and the five Reno boys escaped to St. Louis, Missouri. It was around the same time Wilkinson split with his wife, Julia Ann, in 1858, and by the time the rest of the Reno clan moved back to Jackson County in 1860, they settled in Seymour. It was said the residents of New Rockford still held a grudge, and made it known the Reno brothers were not looked upon highly after their return. Luckily for Wilkinson Reno and his sons, another major conflict was beginning, not too far from Jackson County, Indiana. The Civil War's early days were upon them, and enlisting was the perfect ticket for the Reno brothers to escape the wrath of Rockford and start new lives as soldiers. The first of the brothers to enlist was Frank, who teamed up with an old family friend named Frank Sparks. The two boys teamed up with the Jackson County Volunteers, but Frank Reno's service only lasted a few months before he was honorably discharged in the summer of 1861. The next brother's turn in the army was John, who took part in fighting with the Indianapolis Greys. Much like childhood, however, John grew tired of the heavily controlled environment and deserted his company, traversing the Midwest in the meantime. William Reno fought alongside the 140th Indiana Regiment of Company K, all under the Jackson County Volunteers label. However, his service has been up to debate by way of Civil War scholars. The youngest brother to participate, if one can call it participation in the first place, was Simeon Reno. Sim had a scheming personality, much like his two oldest brothers, and discovered an easy way alongside Frank and John to make money without ever stepping foot onto the battlefield. This activity was called bounty jumping back in the day. Bounty jumping began when someone from a rich or prosperous background was drafted for service 
only to turn around and hire someone else to go in their place. Then, after the prospective soldier would purchase the bounty, they would enlist under a made-up name, desert the order, and then find another bounty, repeating the process until they struck it rich enough to forget about war in the first place. Frank, John, and Sim Reno all jumped bounties for years, using countless fake names and residences to fool union recruiters and avoid both the dangers and even boredom that enlistment could create. They also made money as bounty brokers, helping the rich find takers for their draft selection and earning a finder's fee once the bounty was purchased. Despite their games played with the Union Army, it is still unknown where the Reno family's allegiances were held in regards to the Civil War. Their homeland in southern Indiana was split between Confederate sympathizers and Copperheads, Northern Democrats who only wanted peace. It's possible the Reno's fit in either category, or better yet, they didn't really care about who won the war at all. It was 1864, and an entire year before the Civil War would end, the three Reno brothers who had quit fighting and started bounty jumping were growing tired of the charades. With the heat dying down in Rockford over the old suspicions of the Reno family's antics, they headed back to Rockford, Indiana, this time with a bigger plan in place. Instead of returning with just themselves, the Reno brothers came back to Rockford with outside compatriots and fellow thieves that they met along their three-year Civil War journey. It wasn't all at once, either. These Confederate men slowly but surely worked their way into Jackson County, many of them specifically hired on by John Reno. Their skills ranged from petty theft and cat burglary to counterfeiting and forging. Their activities first started in towns near Rockford, such as robberies in Seymour or Dudley Town, and home invasions at rural homes where the husbands were still on their journey back from the battlefields. The big kickoff to the newly founded Reno gang was a hit on a couple of businesses located in Jonesville, Indiana, a fellow Jackson County settlement. They targeted the Jonesville post office first before heading to Gilbert's store downtown. The Jonesville robbery was taken up by four of the members, Frank, John, a man who went by the name of Dixon, and Grant Wilson. All four men were arrested before they could escape Jonesville, but only one was willing to offer up the others for a shorter sentence. After the four men were released on bond, Grant Wilson told law enforcement that he was willing to testify against his three fellow thieves. It didn't take long for the Reno gang to hear about the snitch, and Grant was found murdered days later. Of course, there was no evidence to support the theory that the Reno brothers killed off Grant before his testimony, and their murderer was never found. Without Grant's testimony, a jury found the remaining men not guilty, and all three men were acquitted. Like a butterfly effect happening in real time, the death of Grant Wilson opened the door for a confident Reno gang to dip their toes in criminal waters further and further from their Jackson County home. By the time 1865 rolled around, the Civil War was coming to a close, and the Reno gang rounded out its membership. Sim had officially joined his older brothers at this point, as had William, who finally finished up his enlistment. The aforementioned Frank Sparks, an old friend of Frank Reno during his days with the Volunteers, also joined in. Together, they set up a gang hideout at the Raider House, a small hotel in Seymour, Indiana. The Raider House is where the gang truly made their first big mark, terrorizing unassuming guests and using the cloak of night to sneak into their rooms and rob them of all their belongings. It got so bad that the Seymour Times editor, J.R. Monroe, declared lynching was the only solution the town had left against the murderous thieves stalking the town's only lodging. As the calendar flipped to 1866, the Reno gang took Monroe's lynching propaganda with a grain of salt. In January alone, they beheaded a guest at the Raider House, dumped the head in the White River, and stuck up a post office in Cortland a few days later. Things didn't slow down for the Reno gang either. They committed another senseless murder in February, followed by more robberies and another homicide in the summertime. By that point, all of Southern Indiana was on high alert for signs of Reno gang activity, despite their unrelenting fear. 
As election season was approaching in the autumn of 1866, the tides of southern Indiana's anger switched from the Reno gang to copperhead politicians. As Confederate sympathizers moved into Jackson County and the surrounding communities, so did the tensions between parties and citizens alike. With the political turmoil came a lessening of the burden on the Reno gang to commit more crimes. In fact, they had so much freedom to scheme that in October of 1866, they'd commit the first ever confirmed peacetime train robbery in United States history. On October 6th, sometime around 6.30 p.m., John, Sim, and Frank Sparks all hopped on a train running east on the Ohio and Mississippi Railway. It was just a few miles out of the depot in Seymour, and no one on board was expecting any type of theft. After breaking into the Adams Express company car, the three didn't even need to subdue the lone messenger, Elon Miller, who tossed them the keys to the safe. They opened it to reveal a whopping $16,000 worth of valuables, or $300,000 in today's money when adjusting for inflation. After the first safe was cleared, the gang toppled over a second safe coming from St. Louis over the edge of the express car, where the rest of the Reno brothers were waiting. This time, they couldn't pry open the safe's door, which was rumored to have protected another $35,000. They dispatched a posse of vigilante lawmen and a few sheriff deputies to give chase against the Reno gang. Eventually, the gang was hunted down by none other than Alan Pinkerton and the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which had been contracted by Adams Express Company to reclaim their stolen safe contents. An undercover sting operation was set up in the old saloon in Seymour, right next to the gang's stomping ground at the Raider House. A few nights after the train robbery, the first three men to be involved, namely John, Sim, and Frank Sparks, were fooled by detectives and arrested. The arrest came as a result of George Kinney, a passenger who gave testimony to detectives and promised to identify at least two of the gang members in court. This would be a poor decision on Mr. Kinney's part, as after the three men were released on bail, George was found shot to death. This brought a silence over the remaining train passengers who all refused to out the robbers, all but guaranteeing the charges would be dropped. The fallout from the Ohio and Mississippi Railway robbery, coupled with an unrelated rape and murder of a fellow Jackson County resident in December, reignited the old calls for lynching uncaptured criminals. Even though the Reno gang had nothing to do with the December crimes, the combined actions of all parties left little optimism in southern Indiana that the local authorities could do their jobs properly and keep the streets safe once more. These brash emotions were confirmed in March of 1867, when two of the men arrested for the December rape and murder were kidnapped by a mob of 250 residents and lynched from a tree in Brownstorn, Indiana. From here, a new group of vigilante lawmen, called the Southern Indiana Vigilance Committee, or the Scarlet Mass Society, came to power. They acted as watchdogs across the region, waiting for criminals to strike. In most cases, the lynchings would have signified a change in the criminal activity of Jackson County, but alas, the Reno gang didn't flinch. In November of 1867, they robbed the courthouse in Gallatin, Missouri, one of their first major forays west of Indiana. The gang came away with about $24,000 worth of bonds and petty cash, but for a hefty price. A few weeks later, John Reno was positively identified as one of the courthouse robbers and arrested by six Pinkerton detectives at the Seymour Railway Station on December 4th. A month or so later, and John finally gave up his run from the law, pleading guilty on January 18th in the very courthouse he last robbed, lynch mobs awaiting him outside. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison to be served at the Missouri State Penitentiary. The lynch mobs wouldn't ever get a chance to hang John Reno as he served 10 years of his sentence before being released in February of 1878. At this point, he was the only surviving brother of the former criminal enterprise as the rest of the Reno gang wasn't as lucky as he was in avoiding the Scarlet Mask Society. A decade prior, just after John was locked up for good, the Reno gang turned to the eldest brother Frank for guidance. He had no notion of quitting the outlaw life and continued to ride with the gang across the frontier 
as they searched for further exploits. The gang's revival took them all the way into Iowa, where they successfully hit a few treasury offices for around $50,000 altogether. Their final stop in Iowa, at the home of legendary outlaw Michael Rogers, ensnared them in the sights of Pinkerton detectives in hot pursuit. In March of 1868, they were arrested in Council Bluffs, Iowa, after being found attempting to burn a few thousand dollars in Rogers' stove. They were sent to jail for the time being, but the feebly cell couldn't contain them, as they dug holes through the walls and ran away on April 1st. The only thing they left behind? A note scribbled in chalk left on the wall above the hole. Just a couple of words reading, April Fools. Of course, the taunt would only bring about bad karma to the real fools of southern Indiana. A few weeks later on May 22nd, the Reno gang decided to hit another locomotive robbery, this time targeting the Jefferson, Madison, and Indianapolis Railroad in Marshfield. This time, they took a much more aggressive approach. After storming the train depot, subduing the engineer, and uncoupling the engine from the rest of the rail cars, they raided the express car. Once Thomas Harkins, the messenger, was literally tossed aside out of the train and killed, the Reno gang ambushed and again fought their way into the safe, this time uncovering valuables totaling $96,000. The Marshfield train robbery was so expensive, it made national headlines on papers, transcending the Midwest, and into the frontier. It provided the Reno gang overnight infamy, but there wasn't much time for the brothers to revel in their spotlight as the Pinkertons were hot on their trail. In their escape, Frank Reno fled to Canada, while his two younger brothers, William and Sim, ran off to Indianapolis to rekindle old gambling habits. A few other members of the party weren't ready to go back into hiding, however, and attempted yet another train robbery on July 9th. This endeavor fired back almost immediately, as a few Pinkerton agents had caught wind of the sting and were already waiting for the gang aboard the train when they broke through the passenger car door. Almost everyone was able to escape after a brief shootout, outside of a lone member by the name of Volney Elliott. Elliott didn't withhold an allegiance to the gang like the others, and was willing to give names and identities to the Pinkertons. As a result, two others were arrested, and the three were held in jail for the time being. About a week later, the wheels finally fell off the Reno gang ride for good. On July 20th, while the three arrested Reno gang members were on their way to prison via train, the locomotive was stopped by the Scarlet Mask Society. The aforementioned Elliot, Theodore Clifton, and Charles Roseberry were all hanged from a nearby tree outside of Seymour after the mob dragged them from the train. A few days later, another group of Scarlet Masks ventured all the way to Illinois, where they gained intel detailing the hideout of another three Reno gang members. This time, it was Henry Jarrell, John Moore, and longtime member Frank Sparks, who were hunted down and returned to Seymour, where all three men were lynched on the same tree as before. The site of these lynchings is now referred to as Hangman Crossing. Meanwhile in Canada, Frank Reno and his associate, Charlie Anderson, were discovered in Windsor, Ontario, a small town on the Canadian border. Both men were extradited and sent to a New Albany, Indiana prison, where William and Sim Reno were being held after they were discovered in Indianapolis. Eventually, the Scarlet Mask Society heard of the four remaining gang members' trial in New Albany, and 65 of the Scarlet Mask's most aggressive members traveled by train to interrupt the proceedings. On December 12, 1868, just after the clock struck midnight, the Scarlet Mask Society made it to the Floyd County Jail, where Frank, William, Sim, and Charlie Anderson were being held. They shot the sheriff on duty for withholding the keys, then beat him senseless before his wife had no choice but to hand them over. Over the course of the next four hours, Frank Reno was pulled from a cell. William and Sim quickly followed, and all three were lynched outside of the jailhouse. Charlie Anderson was the last to be hanged at around 4.30 a.m., and by dawn, the Reno brothers' gang was finally no more. In terms of the aftermath, not a single soul was ever arrested or even wanted for the lynchings of the Reno gang. The Scarlet Mask Society never saw an investigation, 
and many of the same papers that called for the lynchings a couple years previously celebrated the vigilante justice. The legacy of the Reno Gang would remain, both in southern Indiana and across the still developing western frontier. To this day, they are the only federal prisoners to be lynched prior to an official trial, and their train robbing exploits inspired some of the most infamous figures of Old West lore, such as Jesse James and the James Younger Gang, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. John Reno was the only member to survive into 1869, along with his older brother and younger sister, Clint and Laura, who were devoted to the Reno family but never entangled themselves in their siblings' criminal empire. John would later write an autobiography covering the various crimes and misdeeds carried out by his gang in the 1860s. Many of his stories have been questioned and labeled as exaggeration or hyperbole, but the fact remains the same. The Reno Brothers Gang, aka the Jackson Thieves, set the parameters for future Brotherhood of Outlaws that cropped up across the frontier over the next 50 years. They may have met early demises, and their stolen riches may never have been dug up, but one thing is absolute. There has never been a more influential band of outlaws in the history of the United States. The stage was theirs, and Southern Indiana paid the ultimate price. Chaos, violence, and death. All at the hands of the Reno Gang.